Looking for a job isn't easy. It used to be that you could apply at a big name tech company and build a great career for yourself. But times have changed. Many of these companies have gone full woke. And if you aren't the right gender, ethnicity, you don't use pronouns, or if you're not an activist for the preferred cause, then good luck. Why would you risk your career on that? At Red Balloon, we're connecting good employees with top quality companies that value you for your skills and your work ethic, not your social activism score. Employers who post jobs on Red Balloon are focused on creating an enjoyable and productive work culture, free from divisive woke mandates. So if you want to find a serious career path without the nonsense, come to Red Balloon and post your resume today because you shouldn't have to choose between your job and your values. That's redballoon.work, where you can find your future. It's Friday! Mm. Good to be with you. Mm. Cross mm. Baltic on the Fight Lab Feast Network, Pastor mm. Toby, Chuck Knox, and on the water boy. We got... We got OG. That's that's original gangster Ron in the house. In the house, OG Ron. Uh, it's we the first time he's ever been called that. <laughs> yeah, we might need to apologize. OG to him from Cape Corral, Ron. <laughs> Is that, that's not it. Y'all, 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 y'all. This game getting me started. I got you going. Yeah. Man, Gabe, that's pretty good. You got him to do that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> hey, if you're a fan of Cross Politic or the Fight Laugh Easy Network, then surely you know we actually have our very own merch store right yeah. like you've been there many times for buying like you know those special gifts and for- and i haven't even told you guys about this but but um, <laughs> we're gonna be rowdy christian is gonna be at joel webbins boothing at joel webbins oh. uh conference when's that in, it, uh, in two weeks is two that weeks when we baptize joel we uh, uh, rebaptize re- re- joel, joel? <laughs> yeah just into the presbyterian just, uh, <laughs> you know it's gonna happen and, i think you want to go after his kids and then, well, uh, no we want him to oh okay that's and how then, we get the kids he's been baptized and then rowdy christian will be at grace agenda and then i'm trying i'm trying to finish oh all right so we're not okay yeah <laughs> Will you listen to me now? No. You- <laughs> <laughs> Rowdy Christian merch is your one-stop shop for everything cross politic merchandise. We've got t-shirts, hoodies, hats, but we've also got specialty items like backpacks and mugs and coffee. And knickknacks. Even AirPod cases. I like mine. Visit Rowdy Christian merch mm. at rowdychristian.com. And again, we're going to be at... What's the name of the conference? Joel Webbins Conference. Joel Webbins Conference. Facts. Where he's coming out as a Presbyterian. No, I'm kidding, Joel. Uh, I'm just kidding, Joel. I'm just kidding. Yeah. We love you, brother. I mean, and, I mean, he's already a theonomist in post mill. And, and buy that next gift or a little something for yourself. Remember, um, what's the next holiday that's coming up? Uh, Mother's, Mother's Day. Day. Mother's Day. Mother's Day is right Day. around the corner. And Joel fu- Webbins Day. And, and, <laughs> and, 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 and my son's birthday is coming fu- up in yeah, May. Yeah, you know? buy yeah, a gift yeah. in honor of Cash Wrench. <laughs> Again, that's rowdychristian.com. Hey, that's we're Really grateful to have with us on the line right now, Mr. Ron Hensel. He is wow. and has been the senior researcher for Midwest Christian Outreach Incorporated since the founding in 1995. Wow. He's the co-host of the Unknown Webcast, which is why you might not have heard about it, but now you know. <laughs> and he currently serves as a ruling elder at Providence Christian Church PCA Church in Cape Coral, wow. Florida. Wow. Um, and is what, what, he responsible for Jared going Presbyterian? We, 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 <laughs> uh, no. Yeah. Like, I, I live four miles down the road from Tom. Don't do that to me. <laughs> don't you start that. Uh, we understand. We yes. understand. What happened to Ron? I don't know, man. Alligator. He's gone. <laughs> alligator. Tom and Ron went my... alligator hunting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't me. Okay. Uh, Ron, um, Appreciate you coming on Cross Politic, yeah. and um, it turns out we've we've met before, but we we I, I it's been so long, been a little while. Yeah, and, and he sat yeah. next to Chocolate Knox one time and got some of that that That's, that that, that, that glory, Norton. Yeah, yeah. The Shekinah, uh, the Shekinah. Yeah, very good, very good. Oh. Run, wash it off. <laughs> Making Knox it. nervous now. That, that's brother language right you, there. <laughs> you did you did some phenomenal wow journalism recently. Um, I, I, I I don't know how I came across it, but in uh, in the Twitter feeds, um, there was a picture going around um, that somebody had scrawled on and, and identified these two men, um, one of whom was was is Pastor John MacArthur, one of them is uh, mm-hmm. Bill Gothard, and 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 the and the clear um, attempt of this picture going around was to try to link 
John MacArthur to Bill Gothard, and in particular, um, maybe some of his, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, scandals um, in, in his style of ministry, whatever, um, and, and somehow trying to smear Pastor MacArthur. And you wrote this article. It's, it's called um, Inquiring Minds Want to Know the Mystery Photo. Uh, it was published on April uh, 6th of, uh, of this year. And um, I just wanted to, I just wanted to hear you walk through um, some of what you, you uncovered and record in detail um, in, in that article. Well, th- this is the third article in a recent series that I totally did not plan to write. It started when Megan Basham uh, sent me a text just asking me about whether something John MacArthur had said in a sermon was sound theologically. And I mean, I, as soon as I looked at this quote, I thought, sounds like he's quoting a Puritan. Mm. And and the thing is, um, apparently, while I started researching it, as I was researching it, um, a, another friend that she'd contacted or somebody sent her uh, the quote that I unearthed almost immediately was from Matthew Poole's commentary on the same text. It sounded like it sounded to me like MacArthur was quoting Matthew Poole. And then I, I gave her a few other quotes from Matthew Henry from Calvin and said, look, this is system. Yeah, this is sound teaching. Uh, and and I wasn't really since uh, I, I don't exactly have direct access to Rachel Den Hollander's Twitter account uh, like <laughs> regular people. Um, I I had to kind of. It's not hard to see on a Twitter account when you're blocked. I mean, you can just go in through an incognito or you know, right. you know window, right. depending on which browser you're using. Um, so I I looked at the Twitter thread that this was in. I wrote this. I I, I sent her a long email. I said, this could be an article. Don Vino at Midwest Christian Outreach, is always, he always wants me to write articles. And I said, wait a minute, this email could be an article. So it became an article. And um, then uh, Jacob responded, uh, or I, he didn't exactly respond. He, he wrote his own tweet. Uh, and he said, and he tried to do the same thing, only he found a John MacArthur sermon that um, he thought, was giving Bill Gothard's teaching on the umbrella of protection. Well, we wrote a book on this. I mean, maybe your guests know Don Vino and Joy Vino and I wrote a book about 20 years ago called uh, A Matter of Basic Principles, Bill Gothard and uh, and the Christian Life. Yeah, this is mm-hmm. this is our book on Gothard. We kind of know a few things about him. You know, yeah. we actually met with him. I, I asked Don as I was writing these, I said, how many times do you think I met him face to face? And he said four mm-hmm. at least. Uh, we spent many hours with him uh, one on one. We 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 uh, wrote a lot, and we pu- we brought it together. And, and Don did even more research for this book, and we both did actually. And so, when people tell me that this guy John MacArthur, whom I've kind of heard about for the last forty years, <laughs> is teaching the same thing that Bill Gothard is teaching, uh-huh. that gets my attention. You know, it's kind of right. like how did he fly that under the radar? Is what I wanted to know. So I started uh, looking at what Jacob Den Hollander was saying, and I said, no, this is not the same thing. You know, you can use the same language and mean something totally different, and that's what that's what I found to be the case. So I wrote an article on that. And after two articles, you know, there's still a lot of back and forth, not between me and the dev. They've, they've blocked me on Twitter. But between the, the fans of, of them, like, or the followers, and they were still saying, well, there's this photo, this photographic evidence, and that, that proves their point. So all this other stuff you're writing, Ron, is just, you know, you're, you're just uh, making excuses or whatever. Hmm. So I thought, well, you know, who would I know that might know something about whether this, when this photo was taken and, and what it is? I called Don, and the first person we thought of was uh, Bill Gothard's pilot, Larn Gabriel. And uh, I said, to Don, do you think he'd mind me calling him? And and he said no. So we ended up talking, um, and he he said, you know, I, I described the photo to him. I didn't send it to him. It was a me- it was made into a meme. You've seen it probably, right? And I said uh, it has it has Bill Gothard, and to his left, our right is John MacArthur standing behind Johnny Erickson. T- uh, at that time, she wasn't married in her wheelchair. And he says, you know, oh, yeah, that was the Labor Day um, staff retreat 
1979. Um, I said, so you were there? And I go, yeah. He said, well, how, uh, what was your involvement? So I flew both of them to the retreat. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and so I go, okay. Uh, do, do you think you might? He says, you know, I think I might have a picture of that. Well, the next morning I get this email or I might have just opened it the next morning. It says, Ron, is this the photo? Well, it was the photo. It was the photo. And it's still kind of a mystery how this got out, where I've combed every place I can think of to find out how Lauren has his ideas and they might be right, but we, we really don't know how this photo got into the hands that it did and then was transformed into this meme. But it was one of many photos he took at that same event um, he, uh, I think he said he, he flew the, at that time, Gothard had a, uh, Lear 35A jet that he flew down with, he was the co-pilot of that. And he flew it down with, the uh, the pilot to Chicago O'Hare on, I think he said August 31st to pick up Johnny Erickson. He now, and, uh, he knew he had his flight log. He still has the flight log and he still has the entry. Huh. And he says, and I remember flying MacArthur too. And, um, I said, well, you have an entry for him. He says, oh, no, I wouldn't have recorded his name. I go, why not? Well, I don't put VIPs' names in there. And, 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 Ed MacArthur and, at the time I, I was re- not a VIP. <laughs> That's well, hilarious. Well, this is 1979. You know, yeah. I mean, I, I I mean, I remember when's the first time I heard John MacArthur being broadcast on WNBI radio in Chicago, which is the only Christian station I listened to. And I, I asked Don Vino the same thing because we both were in the Chicago area and it, we're thinking it had to be no later, no earlier than 1980. So, um, well, he, he said he would record if in his flight log, he would record the names of, of Bill Gothard, uh, and staff members of the Institute VIPs. Now, uh, one of those VIPs was his future wife, Ruth, uh, Ruth DeSell. Uh, but she wasn't really a VIP, but to him, to him, uh, he, uh she was. So, so anyways, um, I thought, wow, this is this is really interesting. I mean, now the questions were, what was the nature of his involvement? And I mean, they, the, the questions kind of started to answer themselves. I mean, this was not a conference. They, this was not a seminar. This was just a staff retreat. Now, I, I lived right near the Institute for half of my, more than uh, two thirds of my life. I went to a church in the 90s where we had Institute staff members who attended my church. Uh-huh. Um, I, uh, so this is even before I started meeting with Gother writing about him. I was, I was, I, I knew the guy who did the printing uh, for Gother at the Oak Brook campus. He right. was the head of printing. He went to my church. And uh, so uh, I, I knew some, I, I knew other people who had contact with him. He, there were, he had a lot of people who, had some kind of dealings with him in the Chicago area. One of them is another man who also attended my church, uh, Richard Owen Roberts. And he was, uh, he told me he, he did, was supposed to do a series of chapels at the Institute. Uh, he started doing them. And then uh, he was told that he could no longer, he couldn't continue unless he shaved his beard. Uh-huh. Now uh-huh. I, I, in my mind, I picture, I know I've known Dick Roberts for a while. I picture him being born with his beard. I, I don't know if it's possible <laughs> to shave Dick Roberts' beard off. I mean, and I know his wife was adamantly opposed to it. Um, and it ended up uh, in a little bit of a heated exchange between Dick and Bill Gothard. And he said, you, you know what's your problem? I'm kind of paraphrasing. Your problem, Bill, is, is that you have elevated your opinions to the level of scripture. And that was the last time. I mean, he didn't speak after that. Uh, so even to speak at a chapel uh, at the institute headquarters doesn't mean you are on board with Gothard's teachings. Right. Uh, so to so to be teaching or to be speaking, giving a, I don't know a sermon, a devotional. I mean, how come nobody's talking about what a terrible Gothardite Johnny Erickson is? You, you know that's uh, that's right. And she was really uh, she was really the main attraction. I mean, this was. This was the year her her full her feature film was in was premiered, wow, wow. and I'm t- I did one thing I didn't I forget if I mentioned it but I was told that they actually pre they screened the feature film at that staff retreat 
Mm. I was told this, and I, I, ha I have to go back and confirm that. I, I think I, I don't think I mentioned it, but, but it was not. It was not officially premiered until I think it was October twenty fourth in Los Angeles. Uh, so, but they, you know, this is Johnny Erickson. She asks for a copy of her film, and they had sixteen millimeter projection equipment at, at the Northwoods Conference Center. They could have easily shown it. So, um, so they were there. So I started. You know, I was talking to Lauren Gabriel. Tony Gurr, Bill Wood, these are all names that are are people who were very prominent in the 1970s or relative well they became more Tony's name became more prominent later but uh Larn was the was one of Gothard's two pilots uh he tells me if if you were at a live seminar like one of these where they packed it out with 20,000 people at a major auditorium everybody there knew Bill Wood was in charge. Mm -hmm. He was the man who did all the logistics, made sure the lighting was working, the cameras, everything. So uh, he he's extremely knowledgeable about what happened, at least in the latter half of the 1970s. Um, and uh, they all would say, well, yeah, I mean, he was, it wasn't expected that you'd have to be a Gothardite to be invited to speak at something like a staff retreat. So they're using this photo to say, aha, see, he is, he's a Gothardite. He has close associations. He's closely aligned. Well, then, you know, after I went through all of my interviewees, uh, I still hear from, and that is um, uh, John MacArthur. You know, I mean, how do I go about hearing from him? Well, my friend Don Vino, I, I mentioned in the article, he like knows everybody, you know, I mean, he's, yeah. he's a supreme networker. And I said, well, could you kind of fill Johnson for me and see if he'll take some questions to pass on to, uh, to, to Pastor MacArthur. And he got back pretty quickly. This was on my birthday of all days. So I was really happy. It was a nice <laughs> present. Uh, I get, he, he says, uh, just send him to me, get him to me by 10 uh, AM Pacific time tomorrow morning. Well, that's really easy. Cause that's 1 PM my time. Yeah. Um, and I, I got them to, I worked, I wanted to make, make them very precise questions. And I sent them off and I didn't hear back from Phil Johnson until the afternoon. And he said, you know, we were going into the studio to record anyway. So I just asked him the questions on the microphone and I'm going to, when before I go to bed tonight, I'll send you the audio of the question and answer. So I got to hear John MacArthur answering my questions in his own mm -hmm. voice. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure, yeah, I know this is him talking <laughs> in this, in this dialogue that I present in my article. Um, and so, okay, this is his testimony, and he he never supported Gothard. He when he asked Gothard some questions, he wasn't, and I think he might have talked to other people there, and he just he wasn't comfortable with the answers. I explained that uh, in in terms of their approach to scripture or lack thereof, and theological conclusions. So, so that's how that's a kind of a quick for the article um and that's when i put that out and ironically uh it hasn't persuaded anybody who is already persuaded uh, that, are you serious uh, I, I i don't know it's just i didn't do a good enough job in this article oh, I, you I, shut I, up I, you shut up i, I think it. it was my writing style or just my you know so, so i don't know we were we were kind of talking this off I, off air before before you came on and and it seems to us that there's a obvious play to kind of bring down John MacArthur time to Bill Gothard. Bill Gothard had a, about something like 34 uh, different sexual allegations from women uh, against him. And so they, well, were, that's just the recent ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so you got, okay. you, you know, more, you have more knowledge than I do there. Uh, and, and so they're trying to tie Bill Gothard to John MacArthur and try in order to take John MacArthur down and kind of, um, uh, you know, ruin his ministry and, and all that. Uh, well, so the way the way it was presented, I mean, they're already they've already been taking him down in in, in websites I will not refer to here uh, for quite some time. Mm. And of course, I think what started the latest round, especially of the involvement of the Den Hollanders, was the Kate Shelnut February 9th Christianity Today article. Uh, so what's going on here is okay. Well, we've always oh, a bad guy. Here's why. Here's here he is he's just spreading all these terrible Gothardite teachings. Well, what are some of these terrible Gothardite teachings? Well, you know this this um, idea that the husband is the head of the house. You know <laughs> the idea that uh, Gothard had some pretty um, 
narrow ideas on divorce and remarriage and birth control. But what a lot of people don't realize is in the 1960s in evangelicalism, those were not very uncommon ideas. I mean, Gothard was not a, a, an isolated case when it came to people, evangelicals who were opposed to birth control. Uh, the pill, I, when did that come out? 1967? You know, it takes time to adjust to these things. Uh, the um, So w there were others that were not on board with birth control. There were others who were saying there is no exception for allow to, to allow divorce or divorce and remarriage. Hmm. There were others. He wasn't alone. Right. So. You know, one of the things that you you tweeted recently, um, do, you have oh, yeah. that, do you have that, Neil? Did you grab that? Yeah, um, we roll have the clip. Uh, <laughs> you, you copied um, this uh, this tweet from Rachel Denhollander. The highest calling for a Christian is whatever God has gifted them for and called them to, including singleness or marriage. And then you, I think you've underlined this part. The, yes, the yes. idea that there is a hierarchy in God's calling or kingdom is not only not taught, it's explicitly rejected in Scripture. And then you said, do you have is what he actually said about it, Neil? Or no, we just, this is the only uh, tweet that we had. Uh, oh, th well, he, he, he Ron had he a shared this, and I think, it. and I think Ron, you said something like, um, you know, it, how many of the church's modern problems are tied to yeah, the, yeah. to this? I have, uh, let me see if I can pull it up. Um, the oh, I should be able to. It's right there. Um, I retweeted it too. It's, it's on my Twitter. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Well, I'll look for your, I'll look for it on yours. <laughs> uh, it's the last thing I tweeted. Uh, here it is. So, uh, yeah, how many of the controversies currently ripping evangelicalism apart can be traced back to this one thesis? Yep. And I'm, I'm zeroing in on the idea that there is just no hierarchy in what she says that God's calling or kingdom. Now, right. okay, we've got to define all these words. We have to define hierarchy, calling, and kingdom. Now. Sure. I don't, I'm a Westminster Standards kind of guy, right? Yep. So I would say the church is God's kingdom. You know, it's being built on earth. I mean, right. I think there's a I forget where exactly that is. It's uh, I'm teaching through the uh, confession right now in adult Sunday school, but it is. Um, so are you saying that there is no kind of is nobody is in higher authority in the church over somebody else? No one is, has a higher authority in marriage. Well, she doesn't actually bring marriage into it, but so let's just talk about God's calling or kingdom. Right. Okay. Where is your definition, which is not provided here? Maybe it's she provides it elsewhere. Where is that definition explicitly rejected in Scripture? This is this is. Um, I think this is kind of ground zero for a lot of what's going on. Right. in uh, the church today. We've talked a lot yeah. about this. I mean, Knox in particular, you, you've, you've brought this up a number of times with me, um, you know, fifth commandment. Yes. Honor your father and mother as, as foundational for human society and, um, and real hierarchy. And of course, there's also real equality in, the, right. in the kingdom and in the image of God and in salvation. But, you know, as in the Trinity, e equality and hierarchy are not, um, contradictory. That's right. They're Ontological and they're, economic Yeah, realities. they're complementary. Um, yeah. Go ahead. No, so I just, you know, there's so much to say about this. I, well, first, way, first of all, you've got to talk about... No, that's where I'm going. Okay, that's the first thing right. i got to say. Um, you know, Ron, I, I don't think you did yourself good justice, but that's okay. Maybe you're following the scriptures <laughs> when it says, let others praise you. So this, I'm about to do that real quick, because by the time you well, get to talk you. in the article about the photo, the setup there is so good, man. And and this is it's not. I, I told I told Knox first of all that he had to read this article. I said, regardless of the topic, right? This is good journalism. That's right. It is fun to read. You have a great sense of humor it's like a in novel this, in this article. But then the way you unpack it, just little by little, it's it's fun. It's good journalism. I said, Knox, you got to read it because we talk about journalism a lot yeah. on this show. <laughs> and uh, and the way that by the time you get to the picture, this is why you need OGs because. You know, I'm in the news. I'm a producer. I do a lot of this. I do research. I pay attention to the details. What's on the table? What do I need to see? Man, when I saw that picture, do you know I did not see Johnny Erickson Tata? Yeah. I did not see her. Amazing. No. Really? No. Is that's I, I did not amazing. see her. No. I didn't even I mean, know that's, who she was. That's, that's, I mean, I, I okay, I'm a, I, I, I did all this stuff growing up in the 70s. That's the first person I noticed. Right. You see, that's the difference in that's generations, cool. too. Crazy. Right, right, need, right. And, and then the next thing I notice is that Bill Gothard's looking straight at her. Yeah. And 
it's like she's the star. Yeah. Oh. She 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 was on Barbara Walters on to, uh, well she was on the Today Show interviewed by Barbara Walters. Yeah. Uh, five years earlier, she her her best selling book had been out for uh, three years. Yeah. Everybody, she was, she was I mean, the point I, of that picture. Yes. It wasn't Bill Gothard. It, it wasn't, wasn't John MacArthur. It, it was her. But the way that picture has yeah. been construed and cut, because they cut the sides off the picture yeah. and then highlighted the red um, uh, know, the, text it, it around was, it. No, crazy. It, it, it just, I mean, it made me like almost like laugh out loud when you, when you drop that bomb and you're saying. It was a bomb because the research, the way that you went about observing the picture the way you thought about this and the way that you went about finding out the original picture, yeah. brother, I, by the time I get to that part in your article, for me, it was like you took the basketball, threw it up against the backboard, grabbed it in midair, did a 360 and dunked it. That's what that whole piece was like. <laughs> and alley to yourself. Well, <laughs> well I, I, I have it on good authority, though, that my article was nothing more than petty nitpicking. <laughs> So, oh come on! Uh, I, I, I'm just telling you what people are saying on Twitter, you know. And <laughs> That's funny. It was game. Yeah. So, I, a part of me wants to know, like, what what were you thinking of to even go through that process? I realize that I try and look at the whole picture and see things, but it, you had a history that you brought to this that I think a lot of people in journalism, the young ones, don't have. You're asking questions and doing research that we don't think about, and so, I'm, what what was your process even? to go and judge us to start researching it this way? Well, I mean, first of all, it didn't hurt that we'd written a book 20 years ago and mm. that Don, the, you know, the grand poobah of networkers, uh, would, he would tell me about these people, Lauren Gabriel, Tony Gurr. And I did meet Tony Gurr back around that time. Uh, I never met, I don't, I still haven't had a face-to-face -face meeting with Lauren, but uh, I feel like we, you know, are, practically you know, i mean i could move into his house next week i know him so well <laughs> um the uh it, it's um the process was simply a matter of um you know i would i would have been at a loss i think if i didn't have connections if i didn't have just like only one degree of separation from mm. a lot of these people and uh so you know it's i i just in i just based on what we had been through in the um in our process of writing and me meeting with Gothard and, and, and actually just being familiar to some degree with John MacArthur, I just immediately, I knew this was a totally, uh, totally false, uh, construal of what this picture meant. Right. You know, yeah. what does this picture mean? Yeah. I quote Rod Stewart, you know, it's like, what, what I, one another thing I've learned is, is that, you know, your generation knows a lot more about the seventies than mine that went through it, you know? So, uh, uh, or uh, you, you, uh, uh, this is, or maybe you did go through part of the seventies. I don't, I can't judge your ages from here, but I, I was born in but, 79. Uh, so I mean, I'm an eighties baby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. So I'm being told by people who, you know, are, were born in like the mid to late eighties that, that I, I just don't know what I'm talking about. Um, uh, and you know, I wasn't everywhere, you know, but it, I know people who were in a lot were there at these places and at these times, you know. And I, I was at a church. Now I, I went to a church. I son, I gave it on my uh, list. It was in Lagrange Highlands, Illinois. That we were right across town right. from Bill Gothard's home church, right. uh, Lagrange Bible Church. And so I, I mean, I knew people who knew him. And if I had questions, and I did have questions. In the, when the 1980 sex scandal erupted, and I went directly to my friends who attended Lagrange Bible Church, uh -huh. and of course at that time it was oh yeah there was just some misunderstanding or there's there's there are poor judgment calls on the part of Bill Gothard that was the that was the narrative being spun um, by people who I, I know these people so if they had the real information I know they would have been appalled but they didn't have the real information yeah. you know so Ron, I just have to ask so I was at the Southern Baptist Convention. When, um, you know, the whole critical race theory started exploding in, in Resolution 9 and the, the way that the whole convention kicked off was with the panel on sexual abuse in the SBC. Right. And I remember sitting in that panel watching Rachel Den Hollander, uh, Russell Moore and uh, the president at the time, what was J.D. Greer um, and Beth Moore, actually, too. I watched them use something other than an objective biblical standard through sexual abuse to move ministers to do things unlawful biblically, right? And to manipulate them. And it was really interesting because 
following your track record, you care about sexual abuse in the church. <laughs> That's not, you know, you care about that. Yeah. Right. You know, and, and, and yet it seems, yeah. it seems like though, that we are able, so it's not like people don't care. We care. We're Christians. Of course we care about this stuff, but it seems if you don't take a particular approach that's been offered to you now, right. then you don't right. care about it whatsoever. Right. Yeah. You're and, covering it up, in fact. And, yeah. and, and and I, I'm sorry, go ahead. And I, and I also care about people getting away with it yes. because they're taking advantage of, of the process. And, and, mm. and the process is designed to protect people from false accusations, but it's also designed and to to ev eventually catch the you know to convict the guilty. Right. Mm. So how do we keep these two interests in balance? It's very difficult. I'm I'm not. I, what I what I believe has happened is is now we have this new category that you don't find in law. You don't find it's called a credible accusation. Somebody is credibly accused. There's no such thing in in the Bible. There's no such. Yeah. There, you, you you never base a judgment. Everything, everything must be confirmed in the mouth of two or three witnesses. That's right. That's Not, right. Wow. Okay. Where, where's the exception clause? There isn't one. Right. So now, okay, we understand that witness, there are, you know, a, a legal expert will probably come in and say, well, there are times when physical evidence uh, uh, may, ha may bear the same weight or, you know, have right. the same weight as a, a witness, you know. Um, uh, more than uh, human beings are not the only things that can testify against you. Um, right. You know, David put to death a man uh, for simply telling him that he'd killed Saul. Right. Your, right. your own words condemn you. And the guy died right there on the spot. Right. He, only he, he only had one witness against him himself. Um uh, but that's it, when, when it comes to confession. That's all you need. So right. we know what these things mean. We're talking about we're talking about something that can be objectively, as far as we can do it. We weren't there. There there needs to be witnesses, physical evidence. In um, what we're ha what we now have is you know somebody is sounds credible, and, and I've been there. I've listened to it. I believed it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Somebody made the accusation, and well. It turned out to be, if not demonstrably false, at least highly questionable. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, we, we, we were running into a real problem. If we, I believe personally, I am very concerned about a database of individuals who have been credibly abused that is accessible to any, everybody who might have a, uh, a part in making a decision about that person's life, such right. as hiring or. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ron, um, if um, I mean, you've been around, I mean, you were in the, part of the Plymouth Church, you were part of Willow Creek, you were part of um, uh, now, now you're in a PCA church. If you could kind of go back, you know, pull a prophet Ezekiel, go back in time 40 years and warn the <laughs> church about, hey, y'all, you need to get your, your, show up your Bible. Um, here, what would you know? What would you be kind of jumping up and down on the modern church? You know, forty years ago, to kind of prepare us for what wow. we're dealing with now. I mean, all this lack of biblical justice standards that you pointed out. I mean, you know, CRT. Uh, wow. You know, all these things that are going on in the church now, even now, trans and LGBT and and side B women and revoice pastors, and all that stuff. Man. I mean, women pastors. You can go down the list. What would you be jumping up and down on? Well, I, I mean, it's like where do you start? I mean. I, I definitely would say um, that, you know, I, I don't want to overlook the fact that a lot of the abuse stories, like the ones that we deal with, with, with Bill Gothard, um, you know, people, women were being horribly sexually abused mm. by Stephen Gothard, Bill Gothard's brother. In the 1970s, wow! At the Northwoods Conference Center, the same Northwoods Conference Center where, where we have a picture of MacArthur, uh, Erickson, Johnny Erickson, Tata, and and Bill Gothard. That was the location where Steve Gothard committed serial sexual abuse on multiple women. Hmm. And there is probably more. Well, there's more that I won't go into here, but. We we have strong evidence that Bill Gothard knew. We have testimony.
that he knew what was going on and he was still sending young women up there. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I it, in this case, you know, I have multiple women all giving me the same story. Um, some of these, one of these women took the story to her grave. That is Ruth Gabriel, Lauren's uh, wife. Um, but she, I won't say she took it to her grave. She told the story, but it, it, to to Lauren and to others, and she uh, she tried she tried multiple times to get Gother to repent, and he refused. Uh, there are evil people in the church who are taking advantage of the most vulnerable, and yeah. Um, and did his teachings lead to that? I don't think so. You know, I, I think you can. I think you can teach those things. Did he manipulate those teachings in order to accomplish his and, and his brother's e evil ends? Yes, he did. Yeah, they used the authority teaching to manipulate, to con, to deceive. So, yeah, t sound teaching. And I'm, I'm not saying his teaching was sound. It wasn't. But even sound teaching can be manipulated and abused and to get Pharisees. people to do the wrong yeah. thing. Pharisees teaching was. So, yeah. So, um, so anyways, uh, I, it's hard to know where to begin. I mean, we were doing so many things wrong. <laughs> and we probably are doing a lot of things wrong now. Um, but I, I think, um, boy, you asked a really hard question. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if there's a single answer. I think there has to be multiple answers. You know, you, you, I mean, we were watching three's company and we were laughing, Yeah. you know, Yeah. Uh, and I'm not laughing now. Uh. <laughs> uh, I mean, a lot of us in even 10, 20 years ago, we were saying that's where, that's one of the places it started. There, people talk wow. about normalizing. Well, they were starting to normalize homosexuality. Yeah. Uh, and how do you normalize it? Well, you, you, you make it funny. You laugh at it. You laugh, and then you laugh it off, and then it's no big deal. Now, of course, that didn't, it wasn't an immediate thing. It's, it was gradual over time. And most of us remember the Ellen DeGeneres coming out party, you know, on her yeah. program and how that failed. But then what, 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 how many years, how many months after that did we have Will and Grace right. yep. as a TV show? Yep. So it, it, the, um, the it's kind of like the frog the story of the frog in the boiling water or the you put the frog in the water you usually turn up the heat right. until the frog dies well the frog is dead <laughs> mm. yeah, i mean that's so, the, the, the culture's wow. killed it ron ron's so encouraging no uh, no, yeah. no I, it, it's no but I, <laughs> you have a great day too ron <laughs> <laughs> no but yeah but, but actually to that point i mean i think but but we serve the god who does resurrections and so you know that I think I think you're absolutely right. Our our culture's dead, and yeah. and so the only answer is repent. The only answer is you know turn from your sins, cry out, yeah. cry out to God for I mean, mercy. I mean, what one thing I would say is, if I if I go back now, I would say wake up, everybody. You know, um, someday your child or your grandchild, if you don't wake up, one day your child or your grandchild is going to come to you, and they're going to tell you, either. I want to marry somebody of my own or I want to change my gender. You know, it's going to happen in your family. Yeah. Uh, and, and I'm saying, you know, what was the solution to that? Well, better teaching, more time in the word, in scripture. Uh, you know, it's, it, it really, the, the answer is in the word of God. Yeah. The answers are in the Word of God. And what we see now are people scrambling for answers outside the Word of God. In other words, they're doing basically the same thing that their parents and grandparents were doing. I mean, how many, I mean, prayer, I mean, prayer of Jabez is to mind, but somebody says, well, that's in the Bible, but it's not a, a proper application of scripture. <laughs> right. right. That's right. Uh, we, we had, uh, we had the self-help movement. We had, uh, you know, the 12 took off, the Codependency No More book became a bestseller. And then what did you have? You had a multitude of books right. where well-known Christian authors were, were, were modifying the 12 steps for their congregations. Mm -hmm. um, so anyways, uh, like, where do you begin? Yeah, mm. Th that's, that's good. I, it's really good, actually. I mean, the Word of God. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's actually not rocket science. 
It's the word of God. Yeah. It, that's, that's scripture. Is, is scripture sufficient or Amen. isn't? It? Yeah. That's Amen. right. Amen. Right. right. I hope you get some more guys who love, first of all, everybody needs to go read this article. Yeah. Go, go find it. This is like a novel. We'll, and I we'll, hope, we'll link it with the show. It's on the, mid, uh, the Midwest Christian outreach. Yeah. And um, I hope you website. find men who want to write like this because this is how we win brother. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is absolutely impactful. And I was so overjoyed. I'm like, I'm reading Ron and everything he writes now. I know. Yeah. <laughs> go, go. This is so good. Well, and, help. and how can, I, I, I don't know if I can, Knocking them that way, but <laughs> we'll how, how can people follow what you're doing, Ron? Uh, well, midwestoutreach.org is our website. Um, that's where I do right now most of my writing. I don't know if that'll change. Uh, my Twitter account's just at Ron Hensel. Um, I kind of try to keep uh, controversy off of my Facebook page, so you're probably just going to get jokes and funny memes and stuff like that. That works. So. Uh, that's uh, family, friends, and everybody. Once in a while, I like to. I'll point them to this uh, podcast webcast, uh, and that'll invite get them to watch in a whole different way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, every once in a while, I'll throw something in like that. But yeah. uh, Twitter and Midwest Outreach dot org. Awesome. Very good. Well, really appreciate yeah. you, brother. Thank you yeah. very much for coming Thank on the you, show. Yeah. And God Thank bless. You. Thank God you. bless. Keep up the good work. Jesus is Lord in public and in private and in area, every area of life. In every area. area. Every area of life (laughs) must be subject to his lordship, and our use of technology is no exception. What captures our attention on the screen either glorifies or dishonors our Lord. That's why accountable to you, that's the word accountable and the number two and then the word you, is committed to promoting biblical accountability in our families and in our churches. Their monitoring and reporting software makes transparency easy on all your devices, so you can say with the psalmist, I will not set anything worthless before my eyes. Guard against temptation with accountable to you, the word accountable, the number two, and the word you, accountable to you, and live for God's glory beginning today. Learn more, try it for free at accountabletoyou.com slash FLF. I'm not going to push any more buttons because I, I did a boo boo. So, yeah. You trying, you trying to play yeah, something? I was, was going to play something, but, but yeah. play it. Uh, I can't. It's not. It's not. Yeah. It's, it's done now? My hands got electric in them or something and it hit the thing. And but it I, just, I, I like the, the music. The music like helps me like get in my groove. Do not, Gabe. Do no, not. Okay. Help All right. Do not. Country music? All right. Here comes the crossbow to wrap up for Friday, April 21st, 2023. Hey, we had Pastor Zach Garris on the show last Friday to oh, talk yeah. about masculine Christianity. You should buy the book, listen to the book on Canon Plus. Yeah, we I did. talked about this denominate his denomination, the PCA in particular, and the fact that they're trying to figure out if women are allowed to preach in some of their church services or not, <laughs> including their flagship college uh, covenant college chapel services. In other news, the PCA has now sent a formal request to the SBC for assistance on this question. No! And Rick Warren has offered his input, insisting that there's no liberal drift anywhere. <laughs> just, just kidding. They didn't really do that. All the liberals left with the communists, he said, back in the 1980s. Oh, yeah, good. Yeah, I'm nothing okay. to see here, people. Right. On Monday, we covered James O'Keefe's new video exposing the corruption in Washington state prisons, where men can claim to be women and get shipped over to the women's prisons where plans have been made for million-dollar babies to get female inmates pregnant in order That's to claim right. they were raped and make millions. Mm. We also talked to Mason Goodnight. <laughs> and by the way, you guys, did you notice his name is actually spelled Goodnight? Not like Goodnight. No, no, Goodnight. Like he's a good like K- night. Nice. Yeah, K-N-I-G. I just, yeah. I, just, I just caught that earlier. Anyways, he's been recently fired from an Oregon County jail after serving faithfully for 27 years. His crime? Refusing to let women be mistreated by these new tranny policies. Mm. Not only did he refuse to go along with it and get fired for it, when he was given an opportunity to clear his name at a public hearing, he said, I didn't come to clear my name. I came to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then he went on to call his county to repentance and obedience in Jesus' name. It was, it was fire. I mean, it was if, if Knox had been there, he'd been playing the organ. Yeah. On Tuesday, we talked to Brad Dacus from the Pacific Justice Institute, a nonprofit legal defense organization that may be the most open to taking cases in the country, regardless of your profile. Representing cases from religious freedom to parental rights, Mr. Dacus offered their services to Mr. Goodnight and anyone else who finds himself under the gun of the tolerance jihad. And Mr. Goodnight is working with them. Is that oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah. We yes. connected some friends. Yeah. On Wednesday, we talked about what to do when the world goes insane. Yep. Like, for example, when teens 
are meeting up in Chicago to do some looting over the weekend. About They're just that. teens. What do you do? They're just teens. Well, when the world says that you should do anything you want, break all the rules, do anything you want, but there's just one thing you must not do. We should I say you should get your, you should get kind of suspicious. Say, what's that one thing well, you should not you do? do? Yeah, well. And when they say, "Oh, you, you must not be an ordinary man who marries an ordinary woman, and raises a, a troop of ordinary boys Ooh. and girls," yeah, when that happens, you need to get your Tom Sawyer grin on and say, "Watch me." <laughs> when they demand that you be anything but normal, you need to determine in your heart before God that you're going to normal even harder. <laughs> so we talked about raising arrows, kids in a homosexual world. And we said the first and most the f- first and most fundamental thing is faith over fear. Right. We serve the God of heaven, and he has promised to be our God and the God of our children after us. Jesus came into this world to take the curse of sin that has infected all our families, and he came to do that specifically to turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. A home that's marked by this kind of faith and the promises of God is a home where the dominant theme is relief, mm. gladness, singing, dancing, feasting, laughter, forgiveness. Fear creates more strife, and strife creates suspicion and anxiety and accusation and anger and resentment, and that leads to looting and violence in your streets. But Jesus was crucified so that all of that might be crucified in him. He became the curse for our curse so that we might forgive and be reconciled to one another and rest. Yesterday, we watched several clips of talking heads acting like they're still in diapers, <laughs> fussing, arguing, calling each other names, saying ridiculous things. The and View crying. and Don Lamont. Yeah, and we talked about, I don't even know what ethnicity you are, Gabe. Oh. But we talked about some of the same Man. things um, as the day before. Our enemies are determined to get us to join their toddler temper tantrum. Right? Yeah. And, and they want to do that by making us afraid. And then in our fear, getting us to take their bait, which means getting angry, grabbing for power, and joining them in their satanic temper tantrum. Mm. And the one thing they have no answer for is joyful Christian community. Come on now. They have no answer for a woman who loves to make her home a glorious haven. Mm. They have no answer for the smell of baking bread. They have no answer for a man who leads and loves his wife. They have no answer for that man who walks in and kisses his wife like he means it. Mm. They have no answer for kids who love their parents. They have no answer for a congregation of saints singing at the top of their lungs that's right. with grace in their hearts. That's right. And that's why I want to close this week. The central weapon against the darkness is grace. It's grace that forgives and overlooks sin in your home. It's grace that confesses sin. It's grace that gives that relief. It's grace that laughs at the future with courage in your heart. It's grace that sings the top of your lungs. It's grace that stands firm in the face of false accusations, getting fired, and Mm -hmm. then even getting offered a chance to clear your name. He says, no thanks. (laughs) I don't need to. I've already been justified. (laughs) Jesus knows me. Grace wins, and they have no answer to it. And this is why reverent, joyful worship is at the center of it all. The most potent thing you can do every week to fight the darkness is gather with the saints on the Lord's Day to hear the word proclaimed, to sing praises to your king, and to sit at his table to feast with joy. These are the means of grace. They are the central ways that God proclaims that he is for us and that because of the death and resurrection of his son, if God is for us, who can stand against us? For he who did not spare his own son, how will he not with him give us all things? Amen. So. The the exhortation is stay the course. Keep loving your wife like it's war, Mm. because it is. Keep respecting your husband like it's war, because it is. Keep training up your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And I want to encourage you to do this with this final bit of news. Uh, And this is is a summary of of something that happened this week, actually, Mm. um, with the Logos Chamber Choir. And... um, and this is from my friend Roy Atwood. He actually summarized it. He was at this, this concert this week. He, he writes this. The Logos Chamber Choir performed at the Regional Choral Festival down at Lewiston High School today. This was a couple days ago. He writes, they did a great job, which the judges confirmed. I think they got a superior, which is yeah, the highest yeah, you can get. Yeah, my daughter sings with them. And then, and, then, and then Atwood writes this. But what was truly amazing was that the students from all the other schools 
came back in to watch the Logos performance. Wow. And then when they finished, those other students gave them a standing ovation. Wow. Wow. Then, not only that, amazingly, those students from the other schools demanded an encore from the Logos choir. Now, my daughter didn't tell me this. And he says, and Atwood says, wow. this never happens at these kinds of events. Wow. Right? What a great testimony to the Logos choir's quality and skill. The reaction from the non-Logos students to the Logos kids was just remarkable. Well done, Mr. Aaron Snell, the director yes, of our choir. Yes. And, who, who leads worship at our Fight Life Feast yeah, Conference. And your amazing wow. Logos choral students. Wow. Okay. And then, mm. if that wasn't enough, the kids went outside this choir and sang another piece just for fun. Oh, stop. And I want you to think about this as our answer to the looting teenagers in Chicago. This is how we fight. Come on, man. We fight with praise. We fight with grace. Listen to this. I thought so, you were gonna say um, when you're baking bread. I thought you were gonna say when you're baking baking, bacon. When you're baking bacon. That's it. That's, that's, they have, they that's have my no answer, takeaway from They here. have no answer to bacon you know, either. They, no, just, just so you know, we had a really good ending, and you just won. Yeah, that was good. Yeah. So if you're single, get married. <laughs> if you're married, have you some kids, and if you have kids, go baptize them. Until next week, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Go fight, laugh, and feast. This is Cross Politics. Do you smell that? I hope you're not used to it. I'm talking about that vicious, eye-burning, skin-peeling smell that surrounds all of us. The smell of proxy wars with overtones of the parties and Hunter Biden's photos. Feminism, trans madness, faux pandemic, real panic. Climate tyranny, social media slavery, Epstein's suicide. Fair elections with hints of brimstone charred oak. And the Pelosi's stock profits all stewing in a Houston Planned Parenthood's dumpster in August. That is the smell of the thing we once called America, dead and composting. The postmortem on America isn't complicated. First founded by starving pilgrims and slaves, refugees and immigrants crying out to God for deliverance, this nation was pitched like a tent by men and women struggling in the mud and the dust who survived drought and depression and twice left home to bleed and die and save the world. Yes, there was hypocrisy, pietism, self-righteousness, injustice. But this land became strong despite it all by God's grace and by the sacrifice of farm boys crawling up foreign beaches and the sweat of their fathers, tilling soil and feeding beef. American boys tamed the sky and walked in space. We touched the world with our navy, our love of sports and stories, underdogs and barbecue. And now, we touch it all with our rot. The greatest nation in history has been laid low by one simple evil. Lies. The deadliest was the first, the lie that our greatness was our own doing, and so many more came after. The lies of secularism, moral neutrality and self-fulfillment of feminism and Marxism, the lies of the sexual revolution and evolution, pointless wars and taxation, inflation and a manipulated currency, 
the lies that lashed out at God, tearing away at our belief in beauty, goodness, and truth, the lies that sought to place our own lusts and the lusts of our masters on God's throne, lies to control, to placate, and to destroy. The storm of lies has reached hurricane force now. Whole states are being evacuated. The deception swirls so fast and furious that the liars don't even bother to hide it. Question, where do lies get their power? Answer, from the idiocy of the deceived. How many lies can a people believe before it's their own fault? One, two, 44,000. Lies lose all their power when the deceived become wise, when their minds are no longer easy to bridle and control, when they learn to think and can seek the truth through any fog, and when they learn to laugh at those lies, the winds will reverse, the fog will clear. Do not despair. These are the times we were given. We are the people God made for this moment. The faithful and the undeceived will rebuild in the ruins, and we will do it singing, feasting, loving, and laughing. We will plant again and we will harvest 30, 60, and 100 fold. After all, composting empires make the richest soil. New St. Andrews College, liberal arts for lovers of truth, laughing at lies since 1994.